Several years ago, some close friends of ours watched as their two-day-old child died of sudden infant death syndrome as the nurse was desperately trying to save it. Now, you may not be a parent, but something like that compels us to ask the question, how could God possibly let something like that happen if he actually existed? Hi, I'm Kirk and I'm a scientist and a philosopher and a person who spends a lot of time thinking about the why questions in life. So if you're interested in discussions pertaining to God, science and life, then uh, please subscribe to my channel here where I'll be posting on a regular basis. You can also subscribe to my social media accounts and the links are below. The grief over a loss of a child cannot be adequately described. It can be so devastating that it is difficult just to draw the next breath. As the physical component to grief begins to subside over the days and weeks and months that follow, often a single word emerges haunting the person for the rest of their life. That word is, why? How could God permit events that produce such overwhelming grief? C.S. Lewis described his own agony of grief when his wife died in a book called A Grief Observed. In it, he wrote, When I lay these questions before God, I get no answer, but rather a special sort of no answer. It is not the locked door. It is more like a silent, certainly not uncompassionate gaze, as though he shook his head, not in refusal, but waving the question like, peace child, you don't understand. Lewis goes on to write, heaven will solve our problems, but not, I think, by showing us subtle reconciliations between all our apparently contradictory notions. The notions will be knocked from under our feet. We shall see that there never was any problem. I have not found a way to find swift healing from the death of a child or a loved one. I infer from this that the death of a person created in the image of God is by no means a trivial thing. We can only throw ourselves in the arms of God for healing and use this life to prepare for eternity ourselves. I have often been astonished at the assumption that we can so easily make that we should be able to understand the mind of God so well that we can expect to answer questions like these to our satisfaction. C.S. Lewis wrote, If we make mental pictures to illustrate quantum physics, we are moving further away from reality, not nearer to it. We have clearly even less right to demand that the highest spiritual reality should be picturable or even explicable in terms of our abstract thought. When we ask why God permits the death of children, we are not wondering why some imaginary God invented in a human mind and entirely explainable and predictable might allow children to die. We're talking about the real one. There are, however, some glimpses given by God to us that are relevant to this question. I find that it's helpful to reflect on God's perspective of human death. For many people in our culture, death seems as if it will be the end of everything, of life, of potential, of identity and happiness. From our limited human perspective, there is a huge difference between whether a person lives for two years or 85 years. But from God's perspective, and remember, we are asking here for God's perspective on the death of a child. The mortal portion of our life is just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Death is the door through which every one of us must walk. It is the entrance into eternity. Our primary mission in this life is to prepare for eternity and help others do the same. For those who have accepted the gift of eternal life from God's hand, death is the most wonderful moment of our entire lives. God says, precious in the sight of God is the death of his godly ones. 
This life is not all there is. And that one fact alone can make all the difference in the world when we're talking about or when we're grieving the loss of a child or loved one. God knows every child and even every unborn child who has died. For those of eternal life, their names were written before the foundation of the world in the book of life. No one alive may remember a child that died in the arms of its mother 400 years ago, but that child is not forgotten by God. We cannot say with certainty that all small children spend eternity with God, but we infer from the Bible that at least some do, and there is a possibility that they are all in eternity with God, although we do not know this. There is a fascinating account in the Bible on the death of a little boy named Abijah. He was the son of an evil king named Jeroboam. The boy became very sick, and his mother went to see a prophet of God to find out what to do. God spoke through the prophet and told Abijah's mother that as a consequence of the evil of Jeroboam and his family, that he and all of his sons would be slaughtered, eaten by dogs and birds, and literally become feces on the land, except for the little boy. She was told that the moment she entered her house, that little boy would die, and he would be mourned and buried because, and get this, in him something good was found toward the Lord God. Now think about this for a moment. If what God says about life and eternity with him is true, then this life is a nightmare by comparison. Of course, we know nothing different and we're used to it, and many people even find happiness in it. But when we compare it to what eternity with God is like, he states, Things which eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and which have not entered the heart of man, all that God has prepared for those who love him. Like Abijah, there may be young children who are ready for eternity, even though they are mere infants or toddlers, or even still in the womb. To spare them the pain and suffering of this life, God takes them into eternity, even though it means enormous sorrow for the parents who remain. It's terrible for the parents, but not for the child, and God might not put the parents' happiness above what is best for the child. I knew a girl who died in her mid-teens. She had such potential, but she's now gone. Nothing in this life will ever fill the hole that she left behind. There's no glossing over the fact that death is a brutal reality in this fallen world, but... We must remember that from God's perspective, our real potential is not here. It's in eternity. Our mission in this life is to prepare for eternity and help others do the same. And some are ready for eternity at a very young age. Their mission in life is already complete. People who have lost children and babies are all around us. You might be surprised at how many as most people don't speak of the silent pain and the empty ache that they bear for the remainder of their lives. It forces one to think deeply about this, and on one such occasion it occurred to me that angels are free will creatures as well. There are implications in the Bible that about a third of the angels have fallen. This suggests that two-thirds of the angels have freely chosen purity and beauty for all eternity. And as I reflected upon this, the thought suddenly struck me. Could it be that there are human beings conceived who would always choose purity for all eternity, provided they were never permitted to live in this fallen world? For such people, they must be taken while still in the womb or while still too young to be subjected to the immorality of this world. But from our perspective, this would entail the death of of an enormous number of unborn or small children and infants throughout history. They are ready for eternity. Of course, the problem of their own mortality and death must still be dealt with through Christ, but Christ has done that. It goes without saying that if it is true, and remember, I'm only speculating here, it does mean that there will be countless grieving parents throughout history. 
From God's perspective, however, it may be more important to save that child from the evil of experiencing this fallen world. Jesus wept is the shortest verse in the Bible, but it's one of the most powerful. The one who is I am actually wept. And it wasn't because Lazarus was dead, for he was about to raise him back to life in just a few minutes. Rather, it was because he experienced in the moment the grief of Mary and Martha and all humanity as we face the loss of our dearest and closest loved ones. Regarding Christ, God says, We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Therefore, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Well, I hope you enjoyed the video or at least found it thought-provoking. And if you did, please share it or you can leave a comment in the section below. And also, don't forget to hit the like button.